you remember, we introduced uh, Rudolf Virchow as the father of pathology, and he is every pathologist's hero. He has so many wonderful contributions to the way we think about diseases, starting with the spectacular statement that uh, all diseases are the result of abnormal histology. Well, he also has a major role in coagulation, and he developed a triangle which lasts till today. And even though I could probably rattle off uh, two dozen things that would uh, contribute towards thrombosis, they can all be summarized uh, in three categories, and that's why they call it Virchow's triangle of endothelial injury, abnormal flow, and hypercoagulation. If your endothelial uh, cells are injured, disrupted, anatomically, physiologically, that is a main thrust for thrombosis. If the blood flow is non-laminar, perhaps it uh, is static, sluggish, or has a lot of eddy currents, that's another uh, cont contributor towards thrombosis inside of a blood vessel. And all of the things that we can think of which would accelerate uh, coagulation from our uh, diagrams of intrinsic and extrinsic pathways and controls and on them is another major contributor. That's a Virchow's triangle. It has lasted until today. Uh, if you look at the endothelial injury side, you remember we said that uh, uh, endothelium is the uh, nicest guy in the world until you mess with it. Then it becomes uh, uh, from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. And all of these uh, spectacular antiplatelet, anticoagulant, uh, fibrinolytic properties then turn into prothrombotic, some of which completely do the opposite of what it does when it's not uh, messed with. So that's the endothelial part of the triangle. In the abnormal flow part of the triangle, if you think of laminar flow, you know, the little physicists draw vectors and they have little arrows showing how smooth they are, laminar with res Well, if that's disrupted by perhaps other clots or uh, venous or arterial abnormalities or uh, perhaps uh, problems with cardiac motion, like atrial fibrillation. Uh, that induces turbulence or eddies. The arrows are no longer straight. They are now little circles. Or if there's stasis of blood flow, perhaps due to uh, venous problems in, uh, in the veins, uh, these are all contributory abnormal blood flow. Uh, and don't forget, disrupted endothelium in itself introduces abnormal blood flow. And once that endothelium is disrupted, we now have platelets direct in direct contact with ECF. And you know the platelet plug is going to uh, start there, isn't it? If you look at uh, some of the uh, inherited hypercoagulability uh, factors, the single most common is a genetic deficiency of factor 5. If you have a board question, I promise not to talk about the boards because I have contempt for them. But uh, if they introduce a patient and it looks like they have a uh, genetic or inherited uh, coagulation problem, most likely it's going to be either factor V or prothrombin because those are the most common. Uh, it's also fairly common to have mutations in the prothrombin gene or mutations in the methyl tetrahydrofolate gene, if you want to remember those. Uh, the other ones are all rare. I mean, there's such a thing as an antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C, protein S, and fibrinolysis defects, but these are all very, very rare. And uh, I guarantee you'll never see one in your lifetime. But you should probably know about them anyway. I warned you I'd be bringing this back, and I just wanted to remind you again about the uh, triggering of coagulation from both the intrinsic side as well as the extrinsic side of the equation going from 12 to 11 to 9 to 10 on the intrinsic side and uh, on the extrinsic side uh, tissue factor uh, triggering off uh, 7 to become 7a and that directs 
x directly then on 10 to become 10a. And you know what happens after that? Prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin. That's the whole scheme. And I think sometimes when we have important concepts like this, even though I spent like eight minutes on it last time, uh, if I think it's really, really important, uh, I'll introduce it again. Let's talk about uh, some acquired hypercoagulability situations. Uh, and some of these are logical, I hope, if not. You know that if you have prolonged bed rest, you have prolonged venous pumping, I mean, uh, impaired venous pumping, don't you? And therefore, you're likely to have uh, coagulation, especially in the deep veins of the lower legs, patients that are immobilized in bed for a long period of time. Uh, myocardial infarction can introduce problems in a flow, especially in the ch flow in the chambers of the heart, especially atrial fibrillation, in which the atria don't really beat, they just kind of quiver. That certainly is abnormal flow from the, uh, uh, that end of the triangle. Tissue damage uh, can uh, trigger off a uh, tissue factor, whether it's from uh, extensive surgery, fractures, or burns. People with cancers, especially GI or pancreatic cancers, can produce compounds which will produce uh, a direct uh, uh, thrombotic effect on veins. That's called Trousseau's syndrome. Prostatic cardiac valves can uh, disrupt flow and trigger off coagulation. DIC itself is a process we'll talk about later, but in it you have um, coagulation going on uh, in all of the small vessels of the body, and that's a tremendous consumer of platelets and the consumable coagulation factors like factor eight, so you could have hypercoagulability uh, in DIC as both a result uh, and a cause. Uh, hyper, I'm sorry, thrombocytopenia can result in hypercoagulability. You know, patients on heparin are always at risk for thrombocytopenia as well as this other long list we talked about before. And there's an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Uh, uh, lupus anticoagulant syndrome is a really good example. Patients with lupus make a little uh, protein which results in blood from uh, coagulating properly. It's called lupus anticoagulant. Uh, if you want to remember that cardiomyopathies, nephrotic syndrome, hyperestrogens like pregnancy, oral contraceptives, sickle cell anemia, smoking, obesity, these are also risks for hypercoagulability but not as big as the ones we mentioned before. Let's talk about the morphology of blood clots. Uh, if they adhere to a cardiac chamber, it's a mural thrombus. It could be either atrial or ventricular. If they adhere to an artery or vein, they could in, uh, occlude it or they could partially occlude it. Um, so the clot can therefore be obstructive versus non-obstructive. And like in the aging of uh, pathologic processes, uh, clots are at first red. Uh, after a few days to perhaps weeks, they become yellow by virtue of the fact that macrophages come in and start chewing up fatty substances. And of course, with time, they become grayish and white from the fibrous tissue, just like in the sequence of events we talked about in acute inflammation. Uh, that happens with clots as well. Uh, a very acute clot, hours to days. We talked about organizing blood clots. These are the ones that would be yellowish or grayish. They're in the range of, let's say, days to a couple of weeks or so. And then old clots are weeks to months. And old, imp old implies uh, fibroblasts and collagen. Organization implies a lot of ingrowth of blood vessels and acute blood clot involves mostly fibrin and red cells uh, morphologically. Uh, here's a mural thrombus adhering to a ventricle. Uh, here's a mural thrombus adhering to the wall of the aorta. If a uh, systemic uh, arterial blood clot occurs downstream, uh, it's about three or four times more likely to come from the heart than it is the uh, aorta. But those are the only two possible places uh, anatomically, aren't they? So let's keep that in mind, and we'll uh, start off 
uh, the next chapter with slide number 71. Thank you very much.